Good morning and welcome. I'm Councilmember Mitch O'Farrell, representing the 13th District on the Los Angeles City Council. And I'd like to welcome you to my 69th Councilmember in your corner. Since taking office in 2013, I have made it a priority to go door to door in every neighborhood in the 13th District on a regular basis. It is more important now than ever to bring City Hall directly to your door, now virtually, offering services and introducing residents to the people in your city government and our partners who make things happen for you every day. In this virtual edition, our 11th, we're going to focus on the issues on everyone's mind, the COVID-19 pandemic, testing and vaccines. The panelists joining me today will help us understand exactly where we are in this moment in a way that is relevant to everyone tuning in. Our country, sorry, our county, our city and healthcare partners who have been on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic since last year. They're working every day to protect us from this deadly disease and today have taken time to provide valuable information and updates on COVID-19 testing and the distribution of the vaccine. But before we get started, I have an important announcement directly related to the pandemic. I've extended the deadline to apply for the second round of my office's Small Business Emergency Grant Program, which will provide grants of $5,000 to each struggling small business that qualifies within the 13th District. 13th District businesses now have until Thursday, February the 11th at 5 p.m. to apply for this assistance. If you are a business that did not meet the application's criteria during our first round of funding, we've made important changes and relaxed certain requirements in the application process, including increasing the annual revenue cap from $1 million to $5 million, allowing a wider swath of businesses to apply for this round. Again, the application is open to businesses within the 13th district only until next Thursday, February the 11th at 5 p.m. Actually, that's this coming Thursday. A link to the application is available in the comments section of this broadcast. So please share this program with your network and any businesses that you know, because we know because of the pandemic, they're struggling. With that, let's move ahead with the program. The 13th District is home to many essential workers and populations that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 infections. That is why, since the onset of the pandemic last year, my top priority has been making sure that local residents have convenient access to resources to help them weather this crisis. These initiatives have included food distributions, a $100 million rental assistance program for low-income Angelenos across the district and the city, partially supplemented by $1 million for my office's discretionary funds and eviction protections for residents unable to pay rent due to lost income from COVID-19. My office has also partnered with the Los Angeles Fire Department to provide COVID-19 testing, which we'll hear about in just a moment. As we also pivot to the vaccination of individuals, we want to make sure that you have the most up-to-date information and have your questions answered. If you have a question that you would like to ask of our panelists, please leave it in the comments section of this broadcast. We will answer as many as possible, time permitting. Joining me today to discuss COVID-19 testing and the vaccine are Battalion Chief Anthony Hardaway from the Los Angeles Fire Department, Dr. Eloisa Gonzalez with the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, and Jenna Watkinson, Director of Public Affairs with Kaiser Permanente in East Hollywood in my district. Our first presenter is Battalion Chief Anthony Hardaway with the Los Angeles Fire Department. Battalion Chief Hardaway has been a critical figure in my office's efforts to provide free COVID-19 testing to residents in the 13th district at a site nearby the Edendale Library in Echo Park. Battalion Chief Hardaway, I want to thank you for joining us. What can you tell us about COVID-19 testing in the Los Angeles Fire Department's role in the rollout of the vaccine? Please tell us exactly where we are now and welcome. Cool. 
Well, thank you, Council Member O'Farrell, for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Um, like you said, my name is Anthony Hardaway. I'm the Assistant Division Commander of the Testing Vaccination Division. Um, and we've been working with our partners, like you said, with uh, the council districts, the mayor's office, core, curative, uh, Carbon Health, and USC and all, in order to ensure that the citizens of Los Angeles are provided testing and vaccinations. Uh, I'll give you a quick overview of our, like I said, our foot roll and, and where we're at and where we've been so far. Um, so the fire department, we utilize fixed test sites as well as mobile testing groups. Of course, the staffing for that. Uh, our operational hours have been from zero, eight, eight o'clock to four with Dodger Stadium, of course, being the longest, which is eight to eight. Um, when this thing started in March, I recall getting a phone call from my supervisor and he said, uh, we have to come up with some type of thing, uh, program so we can start testing. So that next day in March, we tested about 150 people. And that 150 people, it actually took almost all day to get tested, which brings us to today where we're testing for the LA city, about 3.9 million in COVID testing. Um, with the COVID testing itself, we use a oral swab test kit um, and we have several sites, which I'll get to uh, where people can get that to get tested for free. Um, for COVID-19 vaccines, we've been started, started since December the 30th. And so far in the city, we've uh, vaccinated 268,347. Of course, that is we're utilizing Moderna vaccine, which also has a 28 day second dose. Um, and those people that have been vaccinated in the city of Los Angeles by the fire department, those are also keep in mind, those are patients who met criteria. And I'm sure County of Health will get into a little more of that, but basically tier one uh, in those phases is open all three phases, which are essential healthcare workers. And also one B, which only part of it is the 65 and older. So that's where that number derives from. In the city of Los Angeles, we have several sites. We have Echo Park, which is in Council District 13. That is a fixed site testing site, and it's a walk-up testing site. We have Lincoln Park, which is a walk-up testing site and vaccination site. San Fernando Park in a Valley, walk-up and testing uh, and vaccination. Dodger Stadium, which is a large site, and that is drive-through vaccination only. We have Crenshaw Christian Center, which is drive-through vaccination, Hanson Dam, which is drive-through testing and vaccination and brings us to West Valley, which is a drive-through testing only. Uh, we also have that our mobile groups. We have four mobile uh, testing groups and mobile testing groups is designed to uh, get into areas where we can ha have positive high uh, activity rates. Also the underserved communities, as well as at people who don't have access to get to the fixed testing sites. Um, and we have been operating also in Council District 13 with our mobile testing sites. And those mobile testing sites are running six days a week, as well as the fixed testing sites. Uh, which brings us to Council District 13. Um, the fixed site, Echo Park, um, that started, we've had that up and running since August the 14th. Um, and so far up to date, uh, since our last testing date was the 6th, uh, we were able to test 700 people. Um, like I said, once again, the mobile testing sites, we work with the council districts to um, utilize those in the council district areas to get into those areas. Um, so far, the trends of specifically with Echo Park, of course, I think that's what all around is the trends, of course, after holidays, big events, the testing numbers go up and the positivity rates go up. Um, some of the, 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 the challenges for the Echo Park site specifically, of course, is we had, uh, you know, experience of a vandalism and thefts because that's one of the few areas that it's uh, outside, it's not behind a gate. Um, and also more recently with uh, the restaurants and things like that opening back up is the space and the challenges of intertwining with uh, businesses and testing. Uh, some of our successes, of course, with Echo Park um, has been, of course, providing testing to the community. Uh, it's accessible for the community members and it's also a fixed site, so it stays there. Uh, and that also um, provides people availability. Um, they don't have to have an appointment. They can just scan a QR code to get assisted by uh, one of our partners there to get tested. Um, and also for all, all these things, like I said, we partnered up um, and guy, we were working six days a week, 
and we're making sure that everybody in the community, everybody in Los Angeles has an opportunity to either get tested and vaccinated at one of our sites. Thank you, uh, Councilmember O'Farrell. Thank you, Commander Hardaway. Quick question, and then we'll, we'll get to a lot of questions after uh, all three of you present, but quick question about Echo Park. You mentioned February 6, 700 uh, tests. On average, about how many per day are being conducted at the Echo Park testing site? Average a day at Echo Park is between five and 600. Of course, testing overall, I think, is down. Uh, at the highest, I think we tested around 2,500 at Echo Park. But more recently, those numbers are down because we're moving into the vaccination. I'm not sure if it's uh, due to people um, just waiting for that vaccination, but we have the capability to test 2,500 people at their, their location. And will that site in Echo Park near the Edendale Library, will it transition into a vaccination site fairly soon? Will you, will you be having an announcement about testing and vaccinating as it relates to that site fairly soon? Um, there are talks with the council district and the mayor's office. I don't have that information right now, but there is talking about it, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, and again, for everyone listening, we'll get to questions for all of our panelists uh, at the end of this uh, of the presentations. Uh, so next, the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health is here to discuss the vaccine and its distri distribution process. Since last year, the department has become a mainstay of our daily lives, answering our questions about COVID-19 and providing a sense of security in a time of uncertainty and distress. Now with the availability and distribution of the vaccine, the department is here to make sure we understand the process as well as the facts of the vaccine. And if you're like me, you're consuming so much information on a daily basis about what the latest updates are about the vaccine and uh, how, how uh, effective it is and, and where you can get it. So I'm so, so pleased uh, that joining me today is Dr. Eloisa Gonzalez. So Dr. Gonzalez, thank you for joining us. What can you share uh, with our viewers about the vaccine today? Good morning and thank you so much, Council Member O'Farrell. Um, for inviting me to be here. I really wanna acknowledge the great partnership um, between the city of LA uh, in working with us at the county to protect residents of our great county from COVID-19, um, including all of our vaccination efforts. We are very grateful for the opportunity to share information about the LA County's uh, vaccine uh, efforts up until today. Um, I am very happy to report that we now have administered over 1 million doses of vaccine in the county. Uh, to date, over 10% of our LA County population, uh, age 16 and over, have been vaccinated, and about 3% of that population has now been actually fully vaccinated, meaning first and second doses. Um, at this time, vaccination is only open to healthcare workers, uh, those who are residents or staff at long-term care facilities, as well as those who are 65 and over. Um, and those three groups uh, in total are about approximately 2 million people uh, here in LA County. Uh, but we remain uh, very uh, interested and committed to vaccinating as many people as possible each and every day. Um, unfortunately, the biggest issue that we're facing um, and we continue to face is our ability to really vaccinate, um, in, our, in our ability to, to vaccinate more people is just the scarcity um, of the vaccine supply and the variability of that same vaccine supply. Um, week to week, it can vary, and that has really made it uh, a bit of an issue for planning purposes across the county. Um, makes it quite challenging. Last week, we did receive about 184,625 doses of the vaccine. And um, right now, as more vaccines come into LA County, our priority really is to provide second doses to those who've already received their first dose. We are hopeful that in the coming weeks, um, we will get more vaccine, that it will become available, um, including additional supplies of both Pfizer and Moderna, um, and the possibility of several additional vaccines that are showing promising results in some studies. Um, all of the vaccines uh, have been shown to be safe and effective 
And all of, in all of the late stage trials, they appear to really be extremely, extremely effective in preventing severe illness, hospitalizations, and deaths um, due to COVID. Last week, Johnson & Johnson did submit um, for their, uh, an application for the emergency use authorization, and we are looking forward to it hopefully being approved. Uh, we do continue to see a tremendous amount of collaboration uh, and innovation among our various partners uh, to help really our efforts to scale up in this vaccination realm. And we really thank everyone from volunteers at our megapods to providers in health centers, um, in, in that are located in really high need areas, um, really to everyone, thank you for helping on working on vaccinating our residents. Um, it's really a monumental task, uh, but together we're able to uh, pitch in and contribute. And so we're thankful for all who are doing that. Um, as more people are vaccinated, uh, we're going to be watching the numbers uh, really closely. Um, so that we can ensure a more equitable access to uh, the, the actual distribution of the vaccine. What we are seeing um, already is uh, causing us a great deal of concern um, with uh, what we're seeing more people uh, with having that have more resources, having actually greater access to the vaccine, uh, either because they have more access to technology or to information, or because they have a greater ability to spend more time online trying to get an appointment, or they have the ability to drive or to travel to other areas of the county to get the vaccine. Um, so this really becomes even more worrisome, um, particularly because of the fact that the vaccine is in such short supply. Uh, for people who don't have access to the internet, uh, we do have a low tech option for them to be able to uh, access a vaccination appointment. Um, and that is by calling up our phone number. We have uh, established a uh, number is 833-540-0473. Uh, but please, we do uh, wanna emphasize that this line is only for people who can't make a reservation themselves online. The individuals who are manning that line are using the same exact web page to access appointments as everyone else. So they don't have a secret backstash of appointments that they're earmarking for uh, people who call in. They're using the same system. They're basically just being a proxy for the individual who is not able to actually have computer access or access that uh, website themselves online. Uh, we do need to ensure that in our black and brown uh, and other communities of color that have been most heavily impacted that we are addressing barriers to access, uh, including acknowledging the troubled history of black and brown people being treated in unethical, discriminatory and harmful ways by the medical establishment that understandably creates mistrust. Uh, for the vaccines that are available now, uh, efforts were made to ensure inclusion of Black and Latinx volunteers in proportions equal to their proportion in the population, just to make sure that there weren't factors that would make the vaccine less effective or less safe in either of those groups. Um, both of those groups have seen the greatest proportions of infections, of cases, and tragically of deaths um, during this pandemic. And this vaccine has the potential to save lives and to uh, prevent severe illness. I do wanna encourage everyone who has a question about the safety of the vaccine to talk to well-informed and um, people that they trust. Talk to your doctor or a pharmacist and ask them to answer uh, any questions that you may still have um, or address any concerns. We do have, um, we have brought on additional vaccination locations uh, especially in areas where there are gaps, including uh, we've been working with community clinics and pharmacy partners that are trusted sources of care in our communities. And luckily, uh, we now have over 360 vaccination sites. Uh, we are handling, uh, building capacity even more uh, for strategies to address mobility barriers as well. The state has announced that in the next several weeks, uh, the vaccination effort statewide is going to be coordinated by a third party, Blue Shield of California. And we definitely look forward to working with Blue Shield and with the state 
to ensure that we have an efficient and an effective vaccine distribution system that meets the needs of our community. Uh, during this and after the, this transition, our public health website, vaccinatelacounty.com in English and in Spanish, vacunatelosangeles.com uh, are going to remain portals for the latest information about our local COVID-19 uh, numbers and our vaccination. Um, and those websites are also going to link to the state's uh, be able to link people to the state's website um, for appointment registration. Unfortunately, we have been getting reports of people who have received an appointment for a second dose sharing their access to that scheduling uh, web page with other people who are then scheduling a first dose appointment, uh, even though they're not eligible to be vaccinated at this time. It's very important for people to understand that that behavior is taking away uh, vaccination access to very high risk people who are in fact eligible at this time for the vaccine. Uh, when we discover this kind of uh, fraud in time, we cancel those appointments. Uh, and for those that we don't discover until an individual with uh, one of these fraudulent appointments shows up at one of our, uh, at one of our locations, at one of our county megapods, um, please do note that they will be turned away. Uh, we really do ask everyone to wait uh, your turn for a vaccine to allow other people who are eligible and who are very high risk um, to be able to be the ones who are um, able to register and receive, register for and receive the vaccine. Um, as we continue to vaccinate as many people as possible uh, every day, there are some things to keep in mind. So you may get the, uh, some vaccine side effects in the first couple of days after getting the vaccine. And, and we're seeing in some cases that it, some of these can last up to a week, um, but usually they're only limited to the first day or two. Uh, some of the common side effects include sore or red arm, fevers, chills, muscle aches, headaches, tiredness. Um, just I wanna highlight that these are normal and that these show that your body is actually learning to build immunity. And these are not, in fact, uh, some signs that you actually have COVID-19. Uh, these vaccine side effects are more common after the second dose and as well as in younger people. Um, and they usually, like I said, don't last long. You should feel better within a day or two. Uh, it's important though to emphasize that it's uh, still very important to get uh, your second dose, even if you do get these side effects uh, after the first dose, unless a vaccination provider or your doctor has indicated that you shouldn't get that second dose. Both doses are needed in order to give you the best chance um, of having full immunity. Uh, or with some of the over-the-counter medicines like acetaminophen or Tylenol uh, or ibuprofen, uh, like Motrin or Advil can help with pain, with fevers, with headaches or just general discomfort. But I do wanna emphasize, please not to take these medications before you get the vaccine. Um, wait until after, if you start to experience to take any of those uh, medications. Um, again, you cannot get COVID-19 from the vaccine, but there is still a risk of getting infected with COVID, uh, with the COVID virus both before and after you uh, start getting your vaccine series. Um, it's always best to just talk your, to your doctor and get tested for COVID-19 if you get any of the following symptoms. Um, cough, shortness of breath, runny nose, sore throat, or loss of taste and smell. Uh, so if you do have any of those, it, you should stay home and away from others until you get the result of your test or until your doctor tells you that, it, in fact, you don't have COVID-19. Um, if you're a person with medication allergies, uh, as with any other medicine, it is rare, but possible to have an allergic reaction to the vaccine, uh, such as not being able to breathe. It's very unlikely that this is gonna happen or that that would happen, but if it does, call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. And if you're receiving the site at one of our uh, county sites, uh, know that we do have uh, an area where you'll be able to wait for a period of time in a designated area for observation after the vaccine administration. Uh, people with cancer or with a history of cancer 
can get some vaccines. Um, of course, that depends on the type of vaccine, on the type of, the, of cancer that a person has or had, um, or if they are still being treated for cancer. Uh, I want to emphasize that the COVID vaccine studies did include people with stable HIV and people with active cancer and found that this vaccine uh, or these vaccines were safe and effective for this group, as well as for, um, they, as they were as effective as for other people uh, that were also included in these studies that did not have those conditions. Um, always, always please talk to your doctor if you're concerned about receiving the vaccine at all. Uh, once a person's vaccinated, though, please remember that it is still um, important to avoid interacting with other people outside of your household uh, and to continue wearing a mask when you're around people outside of your household. It's still possible for those who are vaccinated, either with their first or even first and second dose, to be able to uh, potentially become infected with COVID and to spread it asymptomatically. Uh, according to the CDC, it may take up to a couple of weeks for those who uh, received uh, their vaccine series to be fully protected. It's also important for everyone to continue using all the tools available uh, that we have for us to be able to stop this pandemic um, as we learn more about how these COVID vaccines work in the real world conditions. Uh, please do continue to cover your mouth and your nose with a mask when you're around others. Stay six feet away from others, avoid crowds, wash your hands, all of these measures that we've known uh, that we should be following since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, also very importantly, we're extremely concerned about the uh, potential of another surge of infections over the next several months, given the rapid uh, emergence and spread of these variants, uh, the new variants of the virus. Uh, it's important to continue to protect your community by adhering to the physical distancing, face masking, and other precautions necessary to prevent the spread of the, back of the virus, uh, even after being vaccinated. Again, thank you so much, Councilmember O'Farrell, for hosting us today and for allowing us to share this very important information. Uh, I encourage uh, everyone to visit our LA County uh, websites, both vaccinatelacounty.com and County. Uh, vacunatelosangeles.com uh, if uh, there are any questions. Um, and I hand it back to you. Thank you. Dr. Gonzalez, thank you so much. Very informative. A quick question for you before we get to our next uh, panelist. In terms of, uh, you, you mentioned you received, uh, or the county did, 184,000 plus vaccine doses last week. Do you expect that number to be fairly consistent week over week until the production is uh, uh, made uh, larger? And, and when might we receive larger batches within the county? That's a great question, thank you. We are working very hard uh, to lobby essentially to the state to um, be able to have a greater uh, quantity of vaccine uh, which is very sorely needed in LA County to be uh, uh, allocated to us. We have really uh, only uh, a few days notice really the, the, uh, we're, we're told on any given week uh, what we're going to be receiving for the following week. So uh, as I mentioned before, it does make it a little difficult for uh, planning purposes, both for us in redistributing the vaccine to our local to all of our local partners that are uh, delivering the vaccine to their local communities, um, as well as for those sites themselves to do planning because it's difficult for them to know much more than a week ahead of time how much vaccine will actually be uh, available and that we will be able to allocate to them or that the state uh, in, in the case of for example Kaiser um, and Jenna can speak to to that more than I can um, you know who who may be receiving doses directly. So um, it's hard to tell. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to start your question. I just, we really don't know when we will get more vaccine, but we remain hopeful that our efforts to try and, uh, you know, request additional vaccine doses to be allocated to LA County uh, will be heard and enacted upon uh, with great swiftness. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I'm really glad to hear about the distribution to the neighborhood clinics. So important uh, to the 13th district and across the city really. Uh, and we know that oftentimes uh, 
folks will only go to their neighborhood clinic for almost any health care reason. So uh, I'm really glad to hear about that. And um, we all hope that the, uh, the, the quantity will ramp up for, for the entire county. Lastly, I will say this. Like I said, the information just is flowing all the time. I learned that uh, I think it's Moderna is getting permission or, or they're, they're going to double the production rate from 110 days to 55 days uh, to increase um, their own quantities. And so hopefully that bodes well uh, for you know, the entire country, including how we might benefit from that. So uh, you know, we keep our fingers crossed on that. So thank you so much for that great information, uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Our next presenter is Jenna Watkinson from Kaiser Permanente in East Hollywood, which is one of the big three hospitals in the 13th district, Kaiser Permanente. They're at the forefront of so many things healthcare wise, uh, including uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. And so Jenna, welcome and please let us know uh, what you can tell us about Kaiser's role in this vaccination process. Hi, thank you so much for having me and, and thank you for allowing us this opportunity to, to share um, about this really important message. I know some colleagues and I were having some discussions about what we've been through over the last year um, as we approach the one year mark from having our first positive patients. Um, and we've certainly been committed to the fight against COVID-19 at Kaiser Permanente from the beginning. Um, and we think that this vaccine offers a glimmer of hope for all of us. So, um, as you may likely be aware um, from some of the media coverage, the vaccine kickoff um, happened for California, happened right here in Council District 13 at the Kaiser Permanente Los Angeles Medical Center. Um, in this photo, um, in my very first slide, you'll see our nurse, Helen Cordova. Um, she was getting ready to be the very first person in California and among the first in the country to receive the COVID-19 vaccination. I know a lot of people have asked us, why Helen? Um, but she, kind of going full circle, she was, um, she's an ICU nurse and she was one of the first nurses um, to care for our COVID-19 um, positive patients. And so, we felt it only right for her to be able to be one of the first ones to receive the vaccine. Um, and so since then, since that very first dose on December 14th, we have not let our foot off the gas pedal. We have continued to vaccinate at the speed that our supply will allow us, um, which I'll get to in a moment. So before the, I'm sorry, hang on two seconds, I'm having a technical glitch. Um, there we go. So before the emergency use authorization for Pfizer, the Pfizer vaccine, Kaiser Permanente has enrolled in enrolled hundreds of patients in vaccine trials in California, Washington, and Oregon. And so we continue to participate in these trials for younger age groups and other investigational COVID-19 vaccine, vaccines, um, just so that we can, again, be on the forefront of making sure that we are um, on in this fight against the, this, this terrible pandemic. Um, right now, um, we have two vaccines, obviously, as everybody knows, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. And I'm so glad to say that here at the Los Angeles Medical Center, we have administered nearly 26,000 um, first and second doses of the vaccine. And that's been primarily here in the Council District 13 um, at our, our Los Angeles Medical Center. And then Kaiser Permanente across Southern California, um, you can see those numbers there. It's over 250,000 doses of the vaccine. So um, we are really proud of those numbers um, and we are really proud of the amount of staff that we've been able to vaccinate through this to keep them protected and healthy. You can see there the amount of physicians that we have vaccinated so far um, and other staff. You know, I think, I think a lot of people don't realize that healthcare workers go beyond the nurses and the physicians. Sometimes it's also our EVS or um, environmental services staff who are cleaning those rooms after the COVID um, patients exit. And so it's very important that we get our staff um, vaccinated so that we can continue on this effort. And so um, we're, we're really proud of these numbers and we're really proud to be part of continuing to let those numbers grow in the community. 
The vast majority of these vaccines have been administered at our facilities um, on Sunset Boulevard. And so we've recently opened up a vaccine tent um, at 4760 Sunset Boulevard. Um, it's between um, uh, Vermont and Edgemont. Um, there we have been, um, we're, we're administering approximately 1,000 to 1,500 doses, um, but given more supply, we could likely double or even more than double this number at this particular location. And so we're really, you know, again, as everybody's saying, we're waiting for this, this supply to um, increase to meet the demand. Um, but we're also gradually rolling out the vaccine at our other clinics and our other facilities throughout Southern California, but um, even within the Los Angeles Medical Center territory. Um, while our vaccine rate isn't as heavy as at those outlying facilities that you see there, we intend to increase, uh, increase those um, numbers as we increase our supply. Sorry. It's not allowing me to advance my slide. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, you're there? Okay, go for it. Yeah, so here we go. So currently, um, right now, um, we are vaccinating. Um, holy moly. <laughs> sorry. So right now we are vaccinating um, healthcare workers and individuals over 75 years of age. Um, we are very committed at Kaiser Permanente to a committed and expedient and equitable vaccination administration process. So we are taking a phased approach in accordance with the California Department of Public Health and the CDC guidelines. So right now, um, members who sign up at kp.org and other identified target age groups who um, are in our system already um, will receive correspondence when they're tier opens up so that they will know when they're able to make that, um, to, that they're able to make that, that uh, um, appointment. So we're, we're making sure it, it's really important that we, um, if you have questions, you can go on to kp.org slash COVID vaccine. We have um, a hotline that has a lot of information on it um, and it's updated on a very regular basis. So any questions that you have, um, you, can, you can always go to those resources and, and find out. And we also have a kind of a questionnaire or e-visit so that you can identify whether or not you fall within those target areas as well. Um, these are the tiers that we're vaccinating. And this again is in accordance with all of the California Department of Public Health and CDC guidelines. We are, we are following um, as we receive the supply and we're able to open up the additional tiers. Um, we're sort of following the county's guidelines on um, how we're able to open those up um, and look forward to opening up more as the time continues. Um, and I would be really remiss if I didn't call out this slide. Um, until you're able to get vaccinated, we really urge you to do your part to stop the spread. I know Dr. Gonzalez touched on this also, but just staying home if you're sick, social distancing, masking, um, it's just so important for all of us to do our part to stop the spread of COVID-19 um, and make sure that everybody can stay safe and healthy. Um, these are some of the resources that we have available through Kaiser Permanente. We have um, our online resources. And then obviously, you, as I mentioned earlier, um, you can call the hotline, but there's also the, the government resources that have been alluded to here and also through Dr. Gonzalez. So we really encourage you to do your research um, and make sure that, this, um, that you're really informed on this vaccine. So while this vaccine um, offers a light at the end of the tunnel, and we are still very much in that tunnel and we really appreciate everyone doing your part to keep us safe and healthy. And we are here for you if you have any questions or if you need anything. So with that. Jenna, I'll thank you. Back over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, when is it expected that Kaiser Permanente may be able to move into tier, I think it was tier 1B, if I'm not mistaken, uh, vaccine 65 and over? 
So I don't have an exact timeline for you yet because we're still trying to get through that tier 1A. Mm -hmm. um, even, even the tier that has been opened up to 65 and over, we, we do not have the supply to meet that demand either. So we have been slowly opening it up to the age groups to get to that 65 and above, but we're hoping soon. Um, and we are vaccinating as quickly as we can. Um, and we, we are not letting any vaccine go to waste. And so we are very careful and intentional about making sure that we are um, administering the vaccines that we have appointments for um, and that we are very careful not to waste any vaccine either. Thank you, Jenna. And I know that a lot of listeners today are Kaiser Permanente members. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we really appreciate Kaiser Permanente being here today. And, and also uh, your role in all of the trials uh, that helped get us to this point, quite frankly. Um, you're really a leader in the industry uh, in that and uh, innovations in medicine. So we thank you for that. Um, Thank and you. We know how important this is that we continue to be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. um, and so taking part in these trials is just natural for us to make sure that we're, we're doing our part and, and making sure that we are utilizing our resources to do so. Appreciate that. And, and one common theme here between you and Dr. Gonzalez and Commander Hardaway was um, inadequate supply or inventory right now. And, and I think the, the, one of the top things that we can all collectively stay informed about, and that is just a, a consumer of news like myself, is really stay in tune with when the in, inventories will increase at the local level. Because with the systems that you all have set up, that just means you'll be able to get more vaccine out the door in higher numbers. And as Dr. Fauci says, it's all about becoming vaccinated. That's how we will achieve herd immunity once it's up into the 70, 80 percentile and the sooner the better. So really terrific and important information. I wanna thank all three of you. Now, we have some questions and we're going to get to some of those questions now. Councilman, is there a plan for a mobile vaccination unit in our district? We have large senior apartment buildings who are also hoping to be vaccinated without having to wait long lines in person or in their cars. All right, so the, the mobile vaccine unit question, and I do believe that the county is working with the fire department on that, but I'll stop right there and let the experts address that. Dr. Gonzalez, you mentioned mobile vaccine units. Uh, what do you have to say about that? And please, Commander Hardaway, please uh, add, if you have something uh, to add to that. Well, the commander may have more uh, information than, than I do. Uh, it, the, the mobile vaccination that was launched last week was actually a city of LA vaccination effort. Uh, however, uh, uh, the county is also looking to see what we can do to be able to increase more mobile vaccination efforts um, through our sort of system in addition to what the city is doing in, in, in LA city itself. Thank you, Commander. Yes. So to piggyback on that, uh, the Los Angeles Fire Department launched uh, a mobile vax and it's a uh, pilot program down in South, South Los Angeles last week. And I do know that the, uh, the mayor's office and the council district are working together. Uh, they're utilizing demographic data uh, to ensure to see where they're gonna put that, uh, the next locations are. And uh, it, it was very successful. Wonderful. I know that one obstacle is that at our senior centers, seniors aren't really meeting up right now. So one of my questions to Dr. Um, Ferrer a couple of weeks ago was uh, the eventual effectuation of, of actual uh, vaccinating at someone's home. Uh, so I hope everyone will stay in tune to with, uh, in relation to the mobile vaccines and actual home delivery of a vaccine. That doesn't exist yet, but we certainly hope to get there as soon as we can for seniors who may be isolating safely at home. It's really important. Uh, next question. Councilman, how does the county plan to vaccinate people experiencing homelessness and track to make sure that they receive their second dose of the vaccine? Dr. Gonzalez, did you hear that? Uh, can you repeat it, please? Sure. It was uh, it's about homeless, correct? Yes. Uh, uh, do you, would the uh, uh, voice please uh, say that again and, and even louder? Sure. How does the county plan to vaccinate people experiencing homelessness and track to make sure that they receive their second dose of the vaccine? Thank 
you for that question uh, and for saying a little bit more loudly. Uh, we do have uh, efforts for um, the county to uh, reach out to the uh, homeless community. We also provide housing for a lot of the homeless community members, especially if they are symptomatic um, and so or, or have been confirmed to have COVID before they're released from these locations, are, we are making the strongest efforts that we possibly can to make sure that they receive both their first and second dose uh, before being released, especially to those who are not gonna be released to a identified uh, permanent or stable housing uh, situation. So those, those are the efforts that we're uh, currently undertaking to, under, uh, to make sure that this very underserved and extremely high risk uh, sector of our community uh, both receives the, back, the first and second dose of the vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. And it's my understanding that the various service and outreach agencies contracted uh, through Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority um, are also setting up some system since these outreach workers um, uh, get to know these individuals where they dwell. Uh, so more information about that uh, very important issue in the coming days and weeks. Thank you. Councilman, are there any programs in place to help homebound individuals access COVID-19 testing? All right, homebound individuals in relation to testing. Uh, any, uh, any ideas or thoughts on that? Is that similar to the question that was just previously asked, people who can't leave the residence? Similar, yes, and this was specific to testing. Uh, so maybe the home kit uh, availability uh, would help. Uh, could, uh, could someone answer the question about how we can get a, a, a testing kit to someone's home? Uh, from the fire department, I know not specific toward home, but we had a program where we were testing the skilled nursing facilities, mm -hmm. um, providing test kits, and the staff would uh, do the testing there. Um, so I'm assuming that something similar that could be possibly you know, discussed. Yes, and what we'll do, we'll put the information for home test kits. There is a way uh, to order one and have one mailed to you or delivered to your home. Uh, so we'll put that information uh, on the comment section. Councilman, with Dodger Stadium's transition to a vaccination site, have other locations been able to accommodate the increased demand in testing? Okay, this is in relation to other locations to accommodate the increased demand in testing. We went over that a little bit in the presentation, uh, but uh, perhaps, uh, Commander Hardaway, you could uh, reiterate uh, the sites beyond Dodger Stadium uh, for testing uh, and uh, or vaccines. Yeah, so be, because we converted uh, Dodger Stadium to a 100% vax, um, Lincoln Park, um, we have those surrounding fixed sites, Lincoln Park, uh, and don't forget we have our mobile team units that will pick up the slack. Uh, we will station those in inter, uh, nearing and surrounding areas to uh, support that, those efforts for the people who still want to get tested. All right, and for everyone listening, uh, we will put up on our comments section all the information on how to access these answers to your questions as well. Uh, uh, we have time for some more questions. Councilman, what are the greatest challenges to creating supplies of vaccine? Greatest challenges to creating adequate supplies of vaccines. Uh, j just uh, the, the process uh, that was lacking severely um, right around the holidays into the new Biden administration uh, and how those efforts have ramped up significantly uh, since uh, uh, President Biden uh, took office. Uh, and so, uh, Commander Hardaway, if you're still, you're still there, you popped off the screen. Uh, maybe you have information about that. It looked like you started to say something there. I think we might have lost him temporarily. Uh, but stay tuned for more information on that. Um, because we know that uh, from what we've heard, the Biden administration intends on administering 1.5 million uh, vaccine doses per day, and they're at about roughly 1.3 from what I understand. And so hopefully they'll ramp up to that 1.5 million per day. And of course, uh, we will benefit from that proportionally. 
Councilman, this is our last question of this edition of Council Member In Your Corner. How can we in our private lives make sure that our families and friends are comfortable with taking the vaccine and also ensure that it's distributed equitably? So how can we in our private lives feel comfortable with our family uh, actually receiving the vaccine and making sure that they are administered equitably and fairly? So I want to thank Dr. Gonzalez for addressing the higher proportions of infection rates in black and brown communities. Uh, that's a real issue. Uh, and also the safety and efficacy when we have a very, very uh, checkered history in this country um, as it relates to safe vaccinations uh, in uh, black and brown communities. So, Dr. Gonzalez, would you like to expand on that a little bit more? Sure, and I really want to echo uh, what Jenna mentioned too, which is, you know, the, the for those who have any sort of qualms, understandably, of, about the safety of the vaccine for themselves, it's really important for them to really just do their own research and ask those people who are informed, not rely on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram posts from, from random individuals, um, but actually ask someone with you know, a scientific background, a medical background, your doctor, your pharmacist, somebody that, that uh, is in a more official capacity and has the background to be able to educate and explain to you in words maybe that, that you can feel more comfortable with and, and from someone that you can trust um, about whether or not this vaccine is right for you personally. But overall, like I, I had alluded, or not alluded, I had mentioned in my earlier uh, talking uh, for, uh, portion where the uh, current vaccines that are available did include people of color in the studies precisely to try and understand whether there were going to be any concerns um, uh, for these populations to get the vaccine. And what was found was, in fact, they're uh, effective and safe for, the, for as much for these uh, communities of color as they were for all of the other individuals who participated in these early studies. Thank you, Dr. Jenna, would you like to add? Yeah, I'd love to. I know um, from Kaiser Permanente's standpoint, I know that this is, this is a huge effort on behalf of um, what we are doing to make sure that we're getting out into these community, communities of color and educating them um, with people that they trust and with people that look like them. I know I mentioned Helen at the very beginning of our uh, of my presentation, but she has been really a beautiful force for us in that Latinx community um, to help them understand that you know, she was one of those who was really trepidatious about the vaccine. And then she became first in line. Um, she, she really did her research and she did really solid science-based research, not, not to your point, Dr. Gonzalez, research from, you know, random Facebook posts um, that weren't from credible sources, but true um, scientific-based research. And so I think that that's really important for us as an organization as well, and for the community at large to identify those individuals um, who can, you know, go out to those communities um, and, and be that strong voice and be that strong trusted force. And I know that we're doing that across the board. One of the physicians um, who received the first dose that same day um, is a Black physician, and he, um, he has been a, an equal um, strong voice for us in, in the Black community. And, and so as we look at that really equitable distribution of the administration of that vaccine, it's very important for us to identify how we can be that driver and how we can get into these communities um, where these um, where these individuals are, whether it's going into, you know, churches or barbershops or whatever that looks like, we're really trying to make a concerted effort to do so and, and have that educational um, opportunity with them, um, with, with people that they can trust. So right. from, from our standpoint, I know that that's happening. And I think that that's happening, you know, beyond us, but it's, it's definitely something that I can speak to on behalf of Kaiser Permanente. Thank you, Jenna. I can and just yes. Oh, please. I'm sorry, if I can just add, uh, so in addition to asking someone that you personally know and trust, uh, you know, to the degree that you trust the Department of Public Health and our ability to, you know, present the science uh, in a way that hopefully is, is understandable, I, I'd say our, our website, uh, vaccinatelacounty.com and in Spanish, vacunatelosangeles.com are really excellent resources 
uh, for a lot of really commonly asked questions and where we dispel myths and where we you know, highlight the importance of watching out to make sure that you don't become a victim of a scam. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, These times where we've got such limited supplies of vaccine it really is, makes for fertile ground for individuals who are desperate to get vaccine to fall victim to some of these scams. And so uh, we have scam information, um, you know, misinformation, myth rumor information, and commonly asked questions right there on our website in simple and easily uh, to understand language, in my humble opinion. So I think that's another very good resource for individuals to be able to, to access some um, information that is true from a credible source. Thank you so much. And we will publish again all three of these sources, LEFD, Kaiser Permanente, and County Health. Those are three very reliable sources of information that I urge everyone uh, to uh, really pay attention to uh, and, and trust and, and let that be your go-to source and not rumor and innuendo from social media. Uh, Commander Hardaway, uh, any last comments you'd like to make? Uh, no, I'll piggyback on uh, what the other two presenters said about the last uh, question. Uh, along with everything, we also like to use the demographic data uh, and the positive rates in, in those uh, most vulnerable communities um, to assist in, in getting that word out, uh, you know, targeting churches and community groups, just like they said, uh, for those people who don't have access. Wonderful. Thank you. And lastly, I'd like to close with this. Um, I hope that Nurse Cordova realizes that she is part of history. Her, that image, her photograph of taking that very first COVID vaccine will be in the Smithsonian Institute at some point. She will be in the history books. So I wanna thank all of the ICU nurses, all of the first responders, all of our healthcare industry professionals, because you have gotten us all through this unprecedented time during the pandemic when Everyone has been uh, fear-stricken and in great distress and uncertainty. We've lost loved ones. We've had loved ones become ill and recover and some ha who haven't recovered. So it's our first responders, our firefighters, our medics, our, those in the medical field who have really helped keep us lifted through this. So we will forever be indebted uh, to your services. Uh, and that, that is forever. And so we are forever grateful. So thank you everyone for this extraordinary panel and for joining me today. We're thankful to have such capable partners in our efforts to manage this pandemic. I especially wanna thank the crew here at uh, the city's channel 35 studios for making today possible. Please sign up for my weekly newsletter on cd13.com for information on our next council member in your corner. Thank you, everyone, and God bless all the first responders. Thank you.